I'm sitting here with Don Tapscott, CEO of Tapscott Group, co-founder of the Blockchain Research Institute and one of the most influential voices mm -hmm. on blockchain and the digital economy. So thank you for being with us today. Happy to be here. You are a senior advisor for the World Economic Forum. So what are your thoughts on how big a role blockchain right. and the digital economy are playing in Davos this year? Well, it's interesting. First of all, I don't speak for the forum. I speak for myself. But um, I was interviewed by the Wall Street Journal uh, television here. And the guy said to me, you know, this is the third year that we've interviewed you about blockchain. And it, this year, everybody's talking about it at Davos. Um, describe how it's changed over the three years. And I thought about it for, my, uh, for a second and I said, I, uh, well, three years ago, the main person talking about it was me. <laughs> and I was sort of talking to myself and there may be a few other people. Last year, we had the big financial institutions that were talking about it. And also some entrepreneurs uh, around the, the Congress. And uh, also central bankers, ministers of finance. And I spent some time with them. This year, this is the blockchain Davos. And uh, apparently blockchain on the formal program, as a word, appears more than the United States and Europe combined. And uh, someone did an analysis of uh, language and they found that blockchain was the number two word at Davos, number one being Trump. Anyway, <laughs> uh, and that's be it as it may. But. Um, it's an extraordinary thing. It's not just that it's integrated into the formal program and the, and the powerful people are talking about it. I, I estimate there are about a thousand entrepreneurs, investors, um, social activists, social entrepreneurs, uh, academics and so on that have come to Davos and they're not inside the Congress Center, they're outside doing all kinds of things. Right. So you got the Global Business Blockchain Council holding a whole days of programming and having a dinner with 200 people and hundreds of people lined up or ho hoping uh, to get in. There's the, uh, the uh, uh, Crypto HQ. I wonder what that was for days. I couldn't get in there because there were lineups all the time. Um, and everywhere there are activities. So I'm walking along the street, someone recognizes me, says, we're having a big blockchain meeting upstairs. Would you come and speak to us? And I go upstairs and there are like 100 people in a room and I do a panel uh, discussion and answer a bunch of questions. So th this is a very, it's very reflective of what's happening more broadly in the world. That finally this technology is, is not just come of age, it's really becoming part of the vernacular and everyone's trying to figure it out. So how do you feel the Canadian government piloting Ethereum blockchain uh, to create more transparency? Well Canada is a pretty interesting uh, story and when you think about where is this whole thing going to be centered in the world there are a few candidates Switzerland is obviously one. I don't think it's going to be Silicon Valley mm -hmm. basically because leaders of old paradigms have difficulty embracing the new but Canada's got a government that's very interested including the prime minister who was here who's totally into blockchain of all things um, the, and uh, as part of our blockchain research institute we have the Bank of Canada that's doing this work it's the federal government the provincial government and this the, the city of Toronto, but there's also five, not 95, big banks, and they're working to reinvent the payment system. We do have Ethereum that was created by a, uh, you know, a university dropout from the University of uh, uh, Waterloo. We've got um, thought leadership with our, our research institute. The, the two biggest incubators in North America are in uh, Toronto. Mars alone has 1.9 million uh, square feet. And we used to have a brain drain in Canada where entrepreneurs would leave the, the country and move to the US. But now, thanks to two things, that's been reversed. One of them is Donald Trump, where a lot of people want to, especially Canadians, want to move back to Canada. But the second one is it, there was a funding problem that you would get to a certain point with your company, made tw maybe 20 million in revenue, and uh, you need to do a Series A, and some big uh, venture capitalist in Silicon Valley would say, great, we'll fund you, but you gotta move to the Valley. So there was a company drain as well. That's been turned around now because of ICOs, and that people don't have to go the venture route. 
to fund their company. The other thing is that we have a pretty good regulatory environment in Canada too. We sure don't have crazy stuff going on like in some countries in the world. And I'm very hopeful the Bank of Canada is going to be a real leader in, in this space because ultimately every country needs to embrace blockchain for their fiat currency. So we need the digital dollar, the digital pound, digital yen and so on. And that would give central bankers powerful tools to manage the money supply. You change inflation rate, you can see what's happening instantly. You have a crisis, you want to, rather than giving money to the banks, you could helicopter it onto the mobile devices of say the poorest people or something. So. Um, the there's a lot going on in Canada right now. Do you think other governments will be as open to this technology as Canada? Well, all around the world it's very um, uneven in terms of government comprehension of this whole second era of the internet, because that's what we're talking about here. We've had an internet of information for 40 years, now we're getting an internet of value, where anything of value can be moved, stored, transacted in a secure and private way. And trust is achieved by cryptography and collaboration and code, rather than by intermediaries. So that's a very, very powerful thing, and it'll be at the center of any building an innovation economy. But governments Many don't understand it, you know. I was recently in Korea. Here's a country that, you know, created a miracle around the whole first era and they created this amazing manufacturing uh, facility. They call it the miracle on the Hun. And now the Korean government is trying to figure out what to do and they've done some wrong things. They banned ICOs and they're looking at uh, restricting or even banning uh, cryptocurrency exchanges. And I was there, I'm meeting with government leaders and doing a lot of press conferences and stuff saying, this is going to hurt you. You don't want to do that. There, there, there is a public interest here. It's not like the Internet of Information where I always said, just leave it alone. But, you know, if you're doing an ICO and the token represents a share in a company, that's called a security. And it should fall under securities legislation. But we need, you know, micro surgery on this new economy. We don't need a chainsaw. And this is, will be one of the three most important rate determining factors in terms of what countries emerge, not just with a blockchain industry, but with a whole new innovation economy. Is the governments do the right thing or do they, and, and have sensible legislation, or do they mess it up? So what are the ways you have seen blockchain and the digital economy mature throughout 2017? Well, it's been an extraordinary year. And of course, the biggest thing that's caught everybody's attention is the crypto craze, right? And uh, j just a word on that, um, you know, that this is a tulip uh, bubble like in Holland. Um, I don't think those kinds of analogies are quite right, actually. Yeah, there, there, there will be all kinds of volatility and there will be bubbles. But, but think about it. The first era of the Internet information was placed in the commons by Tim Berners-Lee. The second era will, the, the actual protocols are going to be owned by investors and people. So what's the first era worth? How many tens of trillions of dollars? The second era is probably bigger. So the alternative way of looking at this is this is the biggest investment opportunity maybe in human history. Now are a lot of these ICOs Garbage, yeah, well, this is 1995, a lot of the dot-coms were garbage too. Are a lot of people going to lose money? You bet. Um, will there be all kinds of speculation? For sure. Uh, is there hype? Yeah, there's hype. There's that much hype. And, but there, there was that much hype about the internet in 1995, and we talk more about the internet today than we did in 95. So the hype's not going to go up and then burst. It's just going to continue, probably for decades, as we understand that this is the new operating platform for the firm and for the economy. So the other big things that have... But, but what we have here is the sort of crypto... Uh, asset class tail wagging the blockchain dog. You see, because the real pony here is not all this asset stuff, although it may be a big opportunity. Uh, the big uh, the, the, big, the pony in this pile is that we have a new platform emerging that's going to change the deep ar architecture and structure of the firm, that's going to fundamentally transform um, every industry in our economy, 
And over the last year, we've seen some really big developments. Like, you know, I could talk all day about this, but I'll just give you one example. The supply chain industry globally is a $64 trillion industry. And supply chains are going to move to blockchain. You can see that with Foxconn doing this now. We've done a big case on that. On the Walmart uh, uh, food sa use of blockchain for su food safety. And the biggest supply chain in the world ever is the One Belt, One Road project linking Hong Kong and Rotterdam. All the trade fi finance and a lot of the supply um, uh, apps on that are being done on a blockchain. And it's perfect for that kind of situation where you have a buyer and a seller and an escrow agent and governments and various shippers and, and tax uh, authorities and so on. And rather than passing off pieces of paper and fax and emails and so on, they have a single shared network state where they can all instantly see what's going on. So it turns that supply chain into something we call an asset chain. And ultimately, as this thing becomes cognitive, it really becomes a new cognitive computer. That's what a supply chain will be. So in what ways do you think cryptocurrencies will impact the way we understand and use money? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> I don't think that non-fiat currencies will replace fiat currencies. Lots of people may disagree with me. I'd be surprised if Bitcoin got to 1% of transactions in a major country um, five years from now. Um, there is a role for these currencies, but more as a tool for creating new apps. So for example, the global diaspora. People have left their ancestral lands and they send money back home. It's called remittances. Yes. It's a trillion dollar market. Well, if you're a Filipino nanny in Toronto, you don't have to pay Western Union 15% to send money to your mom in, in, the, in Manila. You can use a platform um, for remittances, but that platform actually uses Bitcoin as the underlying um, tool to enable that to occur. So that's not the actual currency. The currency is sort of a, a transition between two fiat currencies. And as I said before, the biggest opportunity is to turn a fiat currency into a cryptocurrency. Like national or? Yeah, yeah, I think that every country should have its cryptocurrency for the next period of human history. Ultimately, I'm with John Lennon. Imagine there's no countries. It's easy if you try, you know. Sure. You know, the whole, the whole idea of the, all these nation states is sort of an interesting idea that came out of a certain period in human history. You know, we, we had these, these areas and, and uh, they were a bunch of cities and they consolidated together and they had a common currency and borders and they created institutions and the rule of law and, and uh, bureaucracies and, and, and so on. It was nation states for national economies. But increasingly, the economy is not national. You know, it's notwithstanding Donald Trump and America first, um, no country can succeed in a world that's failing and increasingly we have regional economies like North America and Europe and increasingly we're going to need some kind of global economy. So it's fun to speculate about stuff like that in the future but I think it's, it's probably not in my lifetime. It's <laughs> you know. very interesting, you can hear it <laughs> Alright, so uh, could you tell us about what you personally uh, will be focusing on in 2018? Well, in the Blockchain Research Institute, we're doing 75 projects yeah. right now. And these are all um, looking at the strategic implications of blockchain to transform the corporation, uh, 10 different industries we're looking at, and also we're looking at seven uh, C-suite functions of management. So what does triple entry accounting mean for the CFO? You know, what, is, what does smart contracts mean for the chief legal officer? What, what does blockchain mean for enterprise architecture? It's fine to have a bunch of pilots, but nobody's thought through, you know, the company's not a bunch of 
of divisions. It's, it's an enterprise ultimately, and we do need enterprise architectures. And we've got a great group of about 60 of the world's leading thinkers that are leading uh, these projects. And over the next year, we're going to complete the projects, and then the management will be out in all of these companies doing executive briefings. And these are typically the CEO and the executive committee of some of the biggest uh, companies in the world. So we're pretty excited that that's going to bring about some big changes. The other thing is uh, both my son Alex and I are spending a lot of time um, out on the road sort of uh, speaking to uh, big conferences and also to, uh, to smaller and import more important events. In three weeks I'm speaking to um, I won't mention the name, but it's 150 CEOs of the 160 largest corporations in America. And they're very curious about this. Most of them haven't quite figured it out. So we're, we're sort of in the business of, um, of uh, breaking log jams and of uh, bringing clarity to the market. And uh, we partner with Hyperledger and the Enterprise Ethereum and Koala and the uh, Chamber of Digital Commerce and these other organizations. They're our affiliates and we're not duplicating what, uh, what they're, they're doing. We're trying to address this, the uh, strategic issues. So that's going to keep me uh, busy for the next year. <laughs> Thank you so much, Maria Johns, Don Tapska for Cointelegraph. <laughs> Thanks, Thank Maria. You. Thank you.